good afternoon. My name is Barbara Blue, and I'm a member of the Hudson Democratic Committee. And today we're going to be discussing the safety of our drinking water with Mindy Mesner, a former state legislature from Rockingham County. Um, she's best known for her legislative and advocacy work on cancer clusters in New Hampshire. And she ha has run a small environmental consulting business for years. And her best known work has been around drinking water protection, cancer prevention, and identifying environmental factors which have triggered a pediatric um, cancer cluster in New Hampshire. Welcome, Mindy. Thank you so much, Barbara. Uh, Mindy, could you tell us a little, I understand you're a scientist, could you tell us a little bit about your educational background? Yeah, so I have been an environmental scientist for about 30 years, and about four or five years ago I decided to go back to school to learn a little bit more about <clears throat> public health outcomes, um, specifically um, cancer and other outcomes associated with environmental triggers. So I kind of was combining my knowledge of environmental issues like water and uh, soil contamination with uh, understanding public health outcomes of exposure to those contamination. And what made you decide to run for the state legislature? Well, it's funny that you ask that because when, um, you know, being a 30-year environmental scientist, I never once thought I would be a politician. Mm -hmm. But um, in 2014, when I identified the pediatric cancer cluster on the seacoast in Rye, basically moms in my town were talking about these children getting sick and dying from this specific type of rare cancer. And when I knew, because of my education at Georgetown, I knew that that was a cancer cluster, so I reported it to the state. And then two years later, in 2016, when the state came back and said that it was a cancer cluster, but we were basically going to take a wait-and-see approach, I knew that wasn't the right thing, the right mm -hmm. answer for my community, because moms were very upset, the kids were upset, my own, tr my own son was upset about it. So I blew the whistle on it um, and started to work on looking at environmental triggers. And just at that time, our current state rep, uh, who was going to run for the Senate, Dr. Tom Sherman, asked me to run to replace him. And I thought, at the first, I thought he was crazy, because mm -hmm. I never envisioned myself <laughs> running for office. But he said, you know, we need, we need scientists and policymaking. We need to understand what's going on with these environmental exposures across the state. And boy, have I learned a lot about how necessary that is in the state of New Hampshire right now. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The cluster? It was from Peace Air Force Base, I understand? Uh, no, they're two separate issues, actually, okay. which both could be contributing to the high rates of cancer. But one thing I learned along the way is that New Hampshire has very high rates of cancers, not just in children. We do have the highest rate of pediatric cancer in the country in New Hampshire, and along with this pediatric cancer cluster. But we also have extremely high rates of breast, bladder, and esophageal cancer, the top in the nation here in New Hampshire. So the cancer rates are very concerning to me, and that has really driven a lot of the policy work I've done in the last few years. The cancer cluster is defined by a certain set of factors that's actually a very high bar to meet. Uh, basically, the children have to have the same kind of cancer, or at least a known uh, similar cause to the cancers within a certain time frame, within a certain geographical uh, distribution, which is the five-town area of the seacoast and uh, a very high rate of this rhabdomyosarcoma, actually a double cancer cluster of rhabdomyosarcoma and pleuropulmonary blastoma. And since then, I've learned that we have three times the expected rate of brain and central nervous system cancers in our children wow. in that same five-town uh -huh. area as well. Oh, that's so that's been the focus of a lot of the work that began my, uh, my launching into a whole different world of, of policy and politics. And I've been happy to be able to do some really good work, I think, in this area. So what has been the cause? Have you found the cause of this cancer cluster? You know, it's very difficult to tie a specific cause. So one of the things uh, Governor Hassan immediately set up at the time, Governor Hassan set up a task force to investigate the pediatric cancer cluster. And we knew about what was happening at Pease. You mentioned Pease Air Force Base. The Air Force Base, um, not only does it have other sorts of legacy contamination, but we found in 2014 that there were very high levels of these perfluorinated compounds, PFAS compounds, that you may have heard about recently in the news. They were at very high levels in the water supply at the Pease Air Force Base, which was turned over for public use. There are daycares there. There are people that mm -hmm. go to work on a daily basis. And 3,000 people are known to have been exposed to that high level of um, contamination is now in their bodies and their blood. So that was one issue we knew about at the time. But then 
as we got working on the, the task force, we, it came to us that there was also this old Superfund site that we kind of all had forgotten about uh, called Coakley Landfill. And mm -hmm. it's a closed landfill that's in the highest part of the seacoast, which is the worst possible place to put a source of contamination because we know it flows in all directions away from the landfill. And we started to look at it and realized that the Air Force had used it as a dump as well. And mm -hmm. we found these same PFAS compounds at very high levels in the water on the Coakley Landfill Superfund dump. And over time, you know, there, it was never closed with a liner underneath, so mm -hmm. just put a cap on the top and let sit there. And um, over time, people built up around the landfill and is now drawing this contamination out from the, under the landfill. So this is what's contaminating the water supplies of five towns on the seacoast right now that we know about. And it's PFAs that are in the They're water? They're called PFAs now. They formerly were called PFCs. Mm -hmm. uh, these are perfluorinated chemicals. They're the types of things that you have in your Gore-Tex, in your, in your raincoats. It's in Teflon pans. It's in a variety of consumer products like the paper that is used to wrap up some of the, the uh, fast food uh, food that you get at some of these fast food restaurants. It's, um, but what we found is very importantly that the most that you get your exposure, the most that you, comes into your body comes probably from drinking water that's contaminated with these chemicals. So that's what we're most concerned about, or I'm most concerned about here in the state of New Hampshire. And what, uh, how does PFAs affect your health? Well, that has been a source of debate. Um, that was really um, hidden for decades, we mm -hmm. now know, by the manufacturers of these chemicals. They've known for decades, since the late 1950s or 60s, that these chemicals cause cancer, they cause um, high cholesterol, they cause low birth, weight, birth weights in our children, they cause a variety of things, testicular cancer, kidney cancer. Um, and so we're just coming to find out about this in the last 15 years or so. Mm -hmm. There was a very large um, 70,000 person study done in West Parkersburg, Virginia, Parkersburg, West Virginia, mm -hmm. where they looked at the effects of people that were associated with this DuPont chemical um, plant. And that has become uh, a very well-known, very top of the line gold standard study, which has told us a lot about the health impacts from exposure to these chemicals. Yeah. I just recently watched the movie, The Devil You Know, yes. which is about Teflon poisoning the water, and mm -hmm. I had no idea about this. Can you tell me, how does, is Teflon safe to use now? There's, I, all my life I've used Teflon cooking ware. Well, I wouldn't use it. Yeah. Um, and I, in fact, haven't used it for a long time ago. I think you may have heard about the thing when they, they realized that birds were dying in people's houses that had Teflon. Mm -hmm. So that was enough for me to mm -hmm. stop using Teflon. Because uh, when you look at birds getting exposed, dogs getting exposed, and then you have children, which I have too, uh, you know, I didn't want to expose my children to those chemicals in our air that could mm -hmm. be causing these birds to die. So that, to me, the canary in the coal mine mm -hmm. is a real thing. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where we're at with that. You know, the um, Devil We Know movie is a really impactful movie. In fact, we have taken that movie, uh, myself, I, I, I founded New Hampshire Safe Water Alliance in 2016 with nine other co-founders. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are um, taking that movie across the state of New Hampshire. We've already done 18 showings across the state. We have, I think, 10 more planned so far. And uh, the idea behind that is to let everybody know about these chemicals, to know about the health effects, and to get people interested in making sure that we protect our drinking water because mm -hmm. it is so vital to our survival to have right, safe, um, clean drinking water. Right. Now, if someone wanted to watch that movie, how could they find it? They can find it on Netflix. Mm -hmm. uh, we would love to have you come out and watch it with us. Um, after the movie is shown, it takes about an hour and a half. We usually have at least a half an hour discussion afterwards. We usually have people like myself and some other scientists, maybe some people in other affected communities come to speak about uh, what has happened in their own communities in New Hampshire about it. Sometimes we have a lawyer or two uh, who has dealt with this problem. So we like the community discussion afterwards. It's a very impactful movie, like I said, and people generally have a lot of questions. So, mm -hmm. Now, is DuPont still putting chem toxic chemicals in the water? That is a bone of contention. So these chemicals are still being used. Uh, they may have slightly modified the chemical structure to avoid um, some of the current issues that we're seeing, but we're finding that these new modified chemical structures are not any safer, although they said they would be. They were safer and easier to get out of the environment. One of the things that's really concerning about these chemicals is once they get in your body, 
they start accumulating. And we don't know a way to get them out of your body. So they just continue to accumulate with continued exposure. When they get in the environment, it's the same thing. They stay there. It's very difficult to get them out. We do have some technologies now which are able to remove them from the environment, from your water. Uh, it's expensive, but at least we know we can get it out of the environment. Mm -hmm. So the plan is to make sure you don't get exposed to it from the right. beginning, mm -hmm. to get it out of the environment so that we're not being exposed to it. Mm -hmm. I understand we have a similar situation in Merrimack with St. Gobin um, producing tox these toxins, C8 and FSA, into the wa drinking water. Correct. Is that still happening? It is still happening. Uh, so I'm very fortunate that one of the bills I wrote last session, SB 309, was passed and signed into law by Governor Sununu in last June. And that bill was twofold. The, it, it focused on the air emissions from St. Gobain. It, it gave the DES, our Department of Environmental Services, the tools it needs to control those emissions. And that is somewhat underway right now. They're still working on details around trying to figure out how they're going to make them comply with that. But then it also had the drinking water side, mm -hmm. which is the way um, we are now looking at what the safe level of these chemicals are in our New Hampshire water, specifically in New mm -hmm. Hampshire. So it's twofold, that bill. Um, I am still concerned that these chemicals and others, we just mm -hmm. found out about last week, some very high levels of other things called volatile organic compounds are being emitted, which we know are cancerous as well, coming out of those stacks in Merrimack. And that's a big concern of mine. Mm -hmm. Now, could you tell, also tell us about, you had HBS 737 is, and 736? Oh, yes, yeah. So those are two bills to form commissions. So mm -hmm. one of them, which I can't remember the numbers exactly, <laughs> but one is to form a commission to have um, the people of Merrimack have their voices heard. Mm -hmm. Basically, the people feel in that community they've been left out of the process with St. Cobain between the Department of Environmental Services and St. Cobain. They mm -hmm. want a seat at the table. They want to talk about things. They want a health study, which is vitally important. They still don't have a health study. And only 200 or so people in the town of Merrimack were able to get their blood tested through a state program. So there are a lot of concerning factors. And that one of those bills is to set up a commission to bring all the people to the table and to find out the solutions that makes, every, you know, that mm -hmm. makes the voices of people the, of Merrimack heard. The other one is a very important commission, too. That is the reestablishment of the Environmentally Triggered Disease Commission, which we had running for two years. That is to make the Department of Environmental Services and the Department of Health and Human, Ser Human Services share their data. Mm -hmm. So we can lay them out on maps, and we can understand where the problem areas are in the state. I said, like I said in the beginning, we have the highest rates of very, um, you know, four different kinds of cancers, including our children, in the country. And so we need to overlay these both types of information on maps mm -hmm. so we can understand where the problems are so we can start to address them. Right now, we have no idea where any of these cancers are distributed. We have really no idea how they overlay, how they might um, tell us something about what's going on in the environment, and then we can address them. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned that you said only 200 people in Merrimack mm -hmm. could get their bl blood tested. Right. Why, why is that? I don't know. Uh, it probably cost. Uh, mm -hmm. I, p the people at Pease, um, the Air Force, was um, you know, covering the cost of that because they caused mm -hmm. the problem at the Air Force Base. So 3,000 people were sampled there. Their blood was sampled, including, I think it's 350 children, which mm -hmm. were impacted by that. Uh, the, the case in Merrimack, their blood, uh, the people who had their blood tested, I think they were random, randomly selected by the state to be 200 or so people. Um, and that's not enough to cover that. Mm -hmm. I think there's 27,000 people that live in Merrimack, and we know that this is the environmental, the biggest environmental tragedy in the history of our state, I believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, 65 square miles of aquifer minimum, we know, is contaminated by the emissions from this mm -hmm. plant and from a couple other sources as well. So, we, the people of Merrimack, really do need expanded access to blood care, blood, uh, blood testing. Yeah, I understand. I talked with a woman in Merrimack who says that she cannot sell her home because yes. she has well water, that no bank or loan company will give them a, lo a loan. Yeah, it's impacting property values across mm -hmm. the state, you know, where there are these areas where there are very high levels in the drinking water, because who wants to buy a house that has you know, water you can't drink or shouldn't drink? Mm -hmm. So it's a big concern of mine. So we really need in the state of New Hampshire to get very aggressive about mm -hmm. these industrial and Department of Defense um, polluters hold them accountable to pay for the reparation for these people, provide people with clean, safe drinking water so that we make sure people don't get sick anymore in New Hampshire. 
yeah, from Hudson. cancer. Yes. Um, and, and I also wanted to ask about our own water in Hudson. Is our drinking water here safe? What is the I haven't been able to check into it too much, but mm -hmm. I did on a cursory review see low levels, uh, which are right around, the, some of them around the, what the state of New Jersey would say is safe. Part of the problem right now is we have a broken EPA uh, that is basically not doing anything. In fact, they just talked about rolling back some of these protections we have on these chemicals on the national level. So we are pushing here in the state of New Hampshire as well as other states are doing the same to really make our states take a proactive stance on these chemicals to protect mm -hmm. our own citizens. New Jersey, in fact, went after five companies uh, telling them that there was so much of this PFAS contamination across New Jersey that they would have to be responsible for paying. And that's the kind of thing I think that we're going to end up having to do here in New Hampshire. In the meantime, though, we need to make sure that the water is safe for people to drink, so we lower those cancer rates. Absolutely. What can the average citizen do about this? Well, if you live in a community and mm -hmm. you're not sure if your water's been sampled for PFAS or other chemicals, and you have a community or a town well, I would ask either the community operator or your town and see if PFAS were detected. You know, first, the town of Rye did not sample for PFAS until a group of citizens requested it very forcefully that they do it, and they did do it. They complied with our request. So people can make a difference. If you understand what your possible exposure is to these chemicals, way they, where they might be uh, in your communities, and you ask the questions, you can make change happen. You can ask for people to sample. You can make sure that people understand that you're not happy with any chemicals being in your water or chemicals at certain levels. So I think it's important for people to be educated. That's the reason we're bringing this movie around the state. So we raise awareness about drinking water contamination and the levels of cancer in the state. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, I guess it's a really scary situation. I had no idea. I had heard of Flint, Michigan, what had happened. And I thought, well, that's in Flint, Michigan. It's not something I have to worry about here in Hudson. But evidently, we do have to worry. And it's very scary. And I really appreciate you, all you've done to Thank help you. bring safe <laughs> water and help us. Um, I'm afraid to drink my water now. Are you, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, I, I don't try to scare people. But mm -hmm. I do want to empower people with the knowledge and the ability to understand that, you know, these chemicals may be in your, syst your water system. So. Um, that's my goal is to educate people and mm -hmm. then to empower them to take action on their own. Right. And certainly I'm, I'm always open to help people. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I really appreciate you doing it. It's been an eye opener for me. I mean, I was shocked when that farmer in that movie, yes. um, the devil you know, lo all lost all 151 cows. They all died from the same reason. And that's certainly very telling and very strong evidence how the dangers of PFA and what we, we need to be very right. concerned about it. Right. Yeah, and we have a, a similar situation unfolding here in New Hampshire where mm -hmm. uh, actually in Maine uh, a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago we found out about a dairy farmer who has to euthanize a thousand cows now because his entire milk supply is contaminated because he took in what's called bio sludges from wastewater treatment facilities, spread it on his land and they're mm -hmm. very highly concentrated with PFAS chemicals and basically contaminated a, a water supply for the town that he lives in as well as now his whole entire business is, mm -hmm. is ruined. So this is the kind of thing where we need to um, really understand what we're doing, be mm -hmm. knowledgeable consumers, don't buy products that you know have these PFAS chemicals in them, try not to create any more waste. Uh, in East Kingston, we just found out last Thursday uh, about a man who operated a septic uh, um, system um, pumping business and mm -hmm. sprayed it for decades on his land and contaminated all his neighbors' wells around his property. Um, so it is, it's a big um, issue that we're mm -hmm. just starting to mm -hmm. unfold here in the state of New Hampshire. Yeah. Now, if someone were employed by St. Gobin in the factory, would they, their health be at risk? I would be concerned about that. Like you saw in the, the movie, um, you know, people are exposed and there were birth defects um, in a, a subsection of, of some of the people that worked there, the women that worked in the plant. Mm -hmm. I would definitely be concerned. And in fact, I have been contacted by people who work in that plant that are concerned about their health, um, that have you know, been, uh, been working there for, for a long time. If someone has been working there, what should they do now? They should understand, uh, know and understand what the possible health effects are from these PFAS chemicals. Uh, go to their doctor, discuss that with their doctor, look mm -hmm. at, um, things that they can do to monitor their health, to understand maybe what maybe early symptoms of some of these issues, um, and then address them if they if they can do that with their physician. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. But, you know, here in New Hampshire, one of the things is not a lot of physicians understand the threats associated with these chemicals either. So that's a whole other thing that we're trying to do is educate physicians. And I think as us, as knowledgeable consumers, that's our job now, mm -hmm. for now, to educate these physicians so they can better understand our situation and help treat it. This reminds me of a book I read about radiation poisoning that occurred in the 1900s when they used to hire factory workers to paint the di radium dials during World War One, yes. and how all of the yep. women came down with radiation poisoning, yes. and no one, right. and the doctors had no idea what to do because they had right. never seen it before. Right, sounds very similar to this situation. Right, and I guess is there somebody that they can co people can contact if they want to get involved in this. Yeah, uh, so New Hampshire Safe Water Alliance on Facebook, mm -hmm. and we also have an Action Network site now mm -hmm. where we, um, you know, send information out to people about these water mm -hmm. impacts. We talk about it on Facebook all the time on this page, and then mm -hmm. we have a group too, so, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Minnie, thank for you. coming. I've learned so much from you, and I really appreciate all you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching our show today, sponsored by the Hudson Democrats. My name is Barbara, and have a good afternoon.